I'm glad that everybody showed up today because this is a, a wonderful Sunday. And um, you know, we're going to get into the word today and make sure my time is good. Okay. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to move right through. Now, I have a, a, some stuff I want to cover with you guys today. It'll, um, I'll try to get all of it. I think I can get all of it, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, and if not, well, then, you know, I guess I'll just be going on to the next, next sermon. Amen. Uh, so what I want to talk about today, well, let's do this. Let's go ahead and jump right in the word. Let, if everybody will go with me to the, uh, let's go to Second Timothy. And it's going to be chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3. And I'll go there with you. I got my digital Bible, but I brought my um, physical Bible out because it just... I don't know. I'm just, I just like this much better. <laughs> All right. And once you get to Second Timothy, like me, say Amen. amen. So we're going to chart. We're going to start in chapter three, and then we're going to read a few verses of scripture there. Then we're going to jump over to chapter four to read some other things, because this is going to set our get our mindset for what we're going to move into. Amen. So now that we're in uh, Timothy chapter 3, let, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. So verses, uh, excuse me, verse 1. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Now Timothy is like a son to Paul because Paul, uh, Timothy is part Greek and Paul raised him up in, in the faith. So he's like a son to Paul. So in Timothy, it says this no, this is Paul talking to Timothy, this no also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their, sel of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. That's a big one now. Because we have a lot of false accusers in the world. <clears throat> Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, different types of lusts. And here's a thing, here's a key, verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. We live in an age where knowledge is abundant. We can, we can go on the internet, type in whatever we want to find, and we can learn so much information. We're always learning more stuff. Somebody at my job said, well, I learned this. Well, how did you find that out? I was just looking up on the internet, and I stumbled across it. That's how it is. We're ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, the truth being Jesus Christ. Now, let's jump over. Uh, oh, actually do this. In verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 3, let's look at verses uh, 12 through 14. Now we left off with ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yea, and all in verses 12, yea, and all that will live, live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution. But evil men that, uh, and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But, he says, but, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So we have to continue in the things that we have learned in Jesus. Amen. Amen. So now let's jump down to verse 4. Verse 4 says, in, uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 4 in chapter 4. Excuse me, not verse 4, but chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Uh, chapter 1 says, charge thee, or verse 1 in chapter 4, <laughs> charge thee therefore, uh, charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his, in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. These fables that they'll be turned unto in these different doctrines are what we have in the world. You have a lot of isms out there. 
You have this ism, that ism, and you have all these different things out in the world, and that's what these people have turned to. And what it is is now they're they're finding teachers who are going to confirm the things that they've turned their turned their their ears to at this point. So what I want to talk about today, uh, because this is the world that we live in. We're uh, like I said, we're living in a world of uh, secularism, pluralism, and then there's another ism that's called privatism. There's religious privatism. Now, uh, secularism is they basically want the church out of everything. They want church out of school. They want church out of the government. They want church out of state. They want church. They don't want any religious thing, anything. They don't want that anywhere. Then you also have pluralism. Now, pluralism is that thing where they say, no matter what you believe, whether it's Buddha, whether it's this, whether it's that, all roads lead to the same path, and that's not true. If there's, only one, there's only one path, and that path is very narrow, and that's through Jesus Christ. So if you haven't accepted that, you can forget all that stuff. Now, pluralism is, is unique, uh, not unique, but it's one of those things where a lot of uh, Christian folks, a lot of people that, that, uh, that I have met, these people, I don't want to say these people, but a lot of these individuals, they believe in God, but then they say, well, this person is so nice. How can that person not make it to heaven? Well, if you haven't accept the truth, which is Jesus, then you haven't accept, you, if you haven't accepted Christ, th and that's the only way that you can get there, then, then, you can't, th then there, there's nothing more to say about that. And you can't believe all these other doctrines and think that you're going to get to the same place. And that's kind of what, what they think. They think that, oh, well, you can believe this and you can believe that, but we're all good people. We're all nice people. You know, I help you, you, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and we all go to the same place after we pass away. That's not true. Uh, and then you have privatization. Uh, religious privatization is a, a spirit that you have in the world, uh, even amongst believers, that feel that they don't need to be in a church. They don't have to have a pastor. They don't, they don't need any fellowship with anybody they can receive revelation by themselves. I can stay at home and receive revelation. I can read the Bible on my own and I'm fine. I don't have to be a part of the church. I'm still this, I'm still that. No, you have to be a part of a body of believers. You cannot do this apart from your own because if you're not, if you don't have a pastor, how are you getting instruction? And even if you look at it in the simple, in the basic terms, if you go out in any profession and if you get a job, I can't go out there and be a structural engineer and say, well, I read the book so I can do it. So it's the same thing with the gospel. You can't just take this home and read it and say, well, I know because I read it. You should read it and you should try to understand it and get a deeper understanding of it. But you can't sit there and say that you don't need leadership in your life because everywhere you look at in, in our walk, in the natural world, there's leadership at every level that you go to. I don't care if you look at President Trump. Before Trump came up, there was somebody above him that had to teach him and had to lead him. Even if you look at Obama, there was teachers that had to teach him in college when he, became, when he studied law. Somebody had to teach him and get him to where he is now. now. And that's the same way with us. We have to have teachers. Thank God we have the teachers that we do have. Amen? Amen. So, and I heard an evangelist say this. Uh, he's an evangelist that travels the world a lot. He uh, defends the faith. And I heard him say this about uh, pluralism, privatization, privatism, privatism, <laughs> excuse me, and secularism. He said that privatization, when it's had its day, will produce no meaning. Plural pluralism, when it's had its day, will produce no reason. And secularism, when it's had its day, will produce no shame. And that's where we're at. We're living in a world without any shame. The world does things and they don't care how, what happens because they're caught up in these, uh, this new age uh, secular humanism and all they focus on in themselves and they think that they find happiness in themselves. No, if you look in yourself, in your heart, you'll find that there's nothing but evil there. And if you, don't, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, then you really haven't come to any type of uh, revelation about anything and you certainly haven't going to the next level, as somebody say, you know, they reach uh, an awakening of some sort. No, you haven't received anything. You've been, you've been deceived. Uh, this world will have you believe that we're born without reason, we live by chance, and we die with no meaning to our lives. And that's not true. We have purpose, and God created us, so there is a reason there. And we don't live by chance. We live by faith, 
But we know that God is always working with us. Amen. Amen. So we know that we live in a world that's without shame. And because they don't have, the sh have, have shame in this world, that what they do is a lot of times they do a lot of things that are defiant to God. And it's come, and come against a lot of things that we're trying to do for the kingdom. They're coming against the kingdom. So what is the people of faith to do? The thing that we need to do, we have to be bold. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about boldness, being bold, speaking boldly. I want to talk about those things because I'm, I'm going somewhere with this and, and you'll see how all of this is going to tie into what the leaders of this house have been speaking to us over the past uh, few weeks and months. Amen. So let's quickly, let's jump to another scripture. Let's go to Proverbs 28. I'll go there with you too. Proverbs 28 uh, is going to be the first verse. So no need to turn anywhere else. And I'm going there with you. And once you arrive there, say amen. amen. Okay. So Proverbs 28. Uh, it says here, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And we have to be bold. Be, and, the, and we're going to talk about that some more because our God speaks with boldness. Therefore, we being after the image of God, we have to speak with boldness as well. And now, what is boldness? Now, uh, I wrote down a few things to kind of give us a, a biblical understanding of what boldness is in this sense. Now, the, you can read the definition, and that has a lot of things. Uh, but I look, looked up a lot of things in Greek and Hebrew, and so I have a, a better understanding about things. So I have it as this. Bold, what is boldness? It is the free and fearless confidence impelling you to do something. Boldness is something that wells up inside you to the point you can't hold back. The Holy Spirit operates in boldness. When we get filled with the Holy uh, Spirit, we have that boldness. We have a capacity for it. When on the day of Pentecost, Peter rose up and he spoke in boldness to the people because now they have that fire inside of them. And that's what you have to allow to burn inside of you when you see things out in the world. Amen. Uh, the world takes credit for a lot of things. They take credit for going against the grain. Uh, you know, if you look at a lot of um, sexually deviant, act, deviant activity, they say that we're being bold. And you see commercials for it. You see it in media. You see it in television. And everything, they say it's bold. But what it is, don't, and let me say this. Don't, uh, a lot of people say bold. They, they take words like, um, bold, don't confuse being bold with being real. Real at, 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 at best, it's being uh, inconsiderate, and at worst, it's just being plain rude. You being real has nothing to do with being bold a lot of times because that, that's not godly. We, we have to build up people when we're giving them advice about things. And that's just a little side note uh, that I just thought of. But uh, the world takes credit for being bold, but what they're doing is they're defying the word of God with their quote unquote boldness. That's defiance. Now, if you look up defiance and you try to get a better understanding about that, you'll then know that defiance is the same as disobedience. And there, so if you look at it that way, their boldness is blatant disobedience to God, just like Sodom and Gomorrah. When they tried to do, when those men tried to do what they uh, did to those angels, that was a blatant disobedience and defiance unto God, which is why God got rid of that city. Yeah. So, so that's how the world is. And people get swept up into this, this feeling of pro, uh, pro, uh, progressiveness. And they think that because there's changes being made that those changes are good and that's not so. You can't let a, a, a couple of negative situations undo the establishments, establishments that we've had in the past. And they're trying to, as Pastor said, they're trying to move the landmarks now. They're trying to get get prayer out of schools. They're trying to get church out of schools. Now, consequently, uh, or if you look at this, the same evangelist that I quoted earlier, that evangelist is being approached by, by teachers and, and, and leadership in Russia to introduce prayer and, uh, uh, excuse me, faith studies in Russian schools. Now, how odd is that? That while we're trying to move it out over in Europe, they're trying to bring it in to the very countries that we say, oh, those, that country is evil. Okay. You may have evil leadership, and, and that can happen, but these people are trying, 
in that country. There are people of faith there too. They're trying to bring the word in, but here all of us are trying to move the word out. And that's, that's not godly. Uh, so in this world, the reason why we're talking about boldness is because the world is, if you think of this, it, when Jesus came into, world, into the world, uh, when he commanded his disciples and sended them out, he said, I want you to go and preach, preach the word and heal the sick. The world is sick. If we're his disciples, it is our job to go out there to a sick world and provide healing, preaching and teaching. Now, we may not all be in the same capacity as like pastors say we get up here and preach. But when you're out in the public, when you're dealing with your friends or you're dealing with coworkers or people that you see, uh, even when I worked on the phones in customer service, I still had to minister to those people as well. Some people good, some people had a, a bad response to it, but I can't let, you can't let that shake you. Not everybody is going to believe the same thing that you're going to believe, and not everybody is going to receive it the same way that you received it. So when you, when you come into those situations, you have to stand boldly, because when you stand with boldness, that's the confidence that you have in God, that you're doing what he commanded you to do. What Jesus commanded the disciples to do, it passes on to us as well. We're to preach to teach, and then we're also to heal the sick. Amen? Uh, so let's go ahead and look at some other scriptures. Uh, let's look, uh, let's see, da -da. let's go to, let's look at some examples uh, of boldness as well. We, we, I've talked about boldness, and uh, we talked about how we can operate, that, operate in that in the world and how it's uh, useful, but let's look at some examples in the Bible of boldness in operation. So what I want you to do, let's go to 1 Samuel 17, verses 23. Because we're gonna, the first example I wanna look at is David. Because David is like a staple of boldness. When you see David in the Bible, he's, when he speaks something, it's, it's bold. He was anointed of God. Uh, and so when he did things, he spoke with boldness. So again, we're gonna, and I'm trying to get there myself, we're gonna go to 1 Samuel, chapter 23, uh, excuse me, 1 Samuel 17, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 17, verse 23. Uh, apologies. Because we're going to look at some examples of uh, boldness at work with, uh, with David. And if you're there, say amen. amen. Okay. So this is uh, when David... During this time is when uh, Israel was battling the Philistines. And we know that we know the story about David and Goliath. We've heard it so many times, so we understand how he, how he slew David. But let's look at the things leading up to before he even stepped out on the battlefield, okay? So in Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, verses 23, uh, Goliath is on the battlefield, okay? And this is David. Now, David left his carriage and, and ran to the army. You see that in verse 22. But verse 23, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philist Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Now, if you read a little bit before that, you know that, that, uh, that Goliath was speaking boldly he was basically he was talking trash to the Israelites he said you can't do anything I will destroy all of you go ahead and come on and try to take me eh, that's my words but in a sense that's basically what he was doing but David heard it now when David heard it let's watch how he reacted because as again we said David there was a boldness in David so when David heard that we'll see why it's important too uh, when Goliath said what he said about Israel, he just wasn't talking about Israel. He was talking about the armies of God. So if he was defying the armies of God, he's also defying God. So if he's defying God, now he's in disobedience. And we, and we know that we have to come against that. Amen? So now let's keep reading and let's jump down to uh, verse... Well, let's look at verse 25. David's still there. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Like, have you seen this guy? 
Surely to defy, there's that word, defy Israel, is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now, let's jump down to, uh, let's jump down to verse uh, 26. Let's look at 26. Let's go ahead and look at that. And David spake to the men that stood by him, uh, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now jump down to verses 32. When he said this, uh, the, when he said this, then the other, uh, it got, the word got back to Saul. Now, Dave, now, and Saul asked them to bring David to him. Now here, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he is a man of, of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Now watch this statement of boldness next. And this servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. See, that is a statement of boldness and of faith because faith, boldness, it, it's in there with faith also because you, it, it works in conjunction with your faith. This is boldness. He said, just as, the, just as I delivered my sheep from the lion and the bear, this Philistine will be just as them. He'll be dead as they were because I have God behind me. And we know that after that, he went on to slay Goliath. This is how we need to operate. We have to speak with boldness when we encounter our enemies. And this is an example of how we operate in boldness when we deal with our enemies. Amen? Amen. Amen. One thing I want you to know with boldness dealing with enemies is that God is always going to slowly increase, increase your faith. He's going to build you up. But you have, to, you have to be willing to receive it. You can't reject it because if you do... You're going to operate always at this low level, never understanding the fullness of what you can operate in. If you look, there's some tragic stories in the Bible where you have people who have so much potential in, in God, but they never reached that full level. They still did good things for God or great things for God, but there's always more that you can do for the kingdom of God. So that's, that's one thing that God is going to do, and that's one thing that God is doing for this church. He's slowly increasing us every step of the way from things of faith we talked about some other things. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but he's increased us. He's slowly increasing us all throughout the year from, from the end of 2018 up to now. He's step by step. He slowly increased us in faith, in boldness, in joy. He's slowly moving us forward. He's constantly inching us, like nudging us. Come on, a little bit more faith, a little bit more faith, a little bit more. It's just like when you have people, when you have kids or, you know, when you first learn to ride a bike, you know, I had help and, you know, they like, come on, come on, come on. And then you, you, there you go. Uh, so he's getting us up to the point where we can go and we'll move forward and we'll do more for God. Let's, um, oh, excuse me. Let's look at something else. Um, we li uh, what I want you to do, let's look at some scripture. Let's go to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3, verses 13. Now, this is now what I'm going to do here. I want to take you to that to that scripture because I want you to see it uh, in whatever interpretation that you have in the Bible, whether it be King James or uh, the Amplified or what have you. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to read this for you in the uh, NIV so you can get a, a revelation of, of what they did here. This is King Nebuchadnezzar just to set the, the tone of what happened here. Uh, the Israel was taken captive by the Babylonians. And you have the uh, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar here. And Nebuchadnezzar had, had a lot of, lot of run-ins with God. And finally he came to full understanding of that after being out in, in the wild. But 
Um, so you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and there was a decree that Nebuchadnezzar did. He built this, this, this image and he wanted everybody, when they play a chime and they do a little thing, he wanted everybody to bow down and worship it, okay? And that's no different than how we live in this world because sometimes we may come to a point where we may be in a situation where, say, you work at a university. They may not want you to pray at that university. Uh, th and a lot of times what the main thing that they're looking at, they don't mind if you pray. They just don't want you to say Jesus. And as soon as Jesus come out of your mouth, then they're like, you know, you got to shut that down. Uh, but we have, but we can't, we can't cow cow to that. We have to, we have to stand up to that. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, so as you're looking at, um, at Daniel, uh, chapter three, verses verses, uh, th chapter three, verses 13 is the, uh, verse that, that I'm starting at, but I'm going to read it to you here, uh, so you can get a, a better understanding. So. Nebuchadnezzar, they sent word to Nebuchadnezzar that, hey, these guys aren't worshiping this, this statue and you need to handle it. I mean, they didn't say it that way, but you get the idea. <laughs> but um, so this is what it says in the NIV. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. So he brought them in and said, hey, is this true that you, you do not worship the image that I made? They haven't answered yet, but he, fit, he continues to say, if you'll fall down and worship uh, this, this graven image, and all is well. We'll forget everything and it'll be okay. But listen to what they said. Uh, we're going to go after that. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately in the, t into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? That's a challenge. He's saying what God will, will be able to save you once I throw you into that furnace. No God is going to be able to save you. Amen. That's what he's saying. That's, he's trying to be bold. He's, that's a challenge. He's challenging their faith in their God. And when we're out in the world, we're gonna, our faith is going to be challenged too. But we can't bow down. And, but let's look at how they answered this. And let me go here in my, um, my Bible also. Now I'm going to read it in the uh, King James Version. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 17 in King James, and then I'm going to read the NIV. But let, I'm going to start from the King James here in Daniel uh, 3, verse 17. They said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, but if not be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image with thou, which thou hast set up. Now, let's read it in the NIV. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So in the world, there's a lot of Christian businesses that are being attacked. And what they're saying to these businesses, they're, they're trying to, <laughs> it's funny, in the world, for as much as we talk about bullying and how we say that's so bad, the world tries uh, adamantly to bully Christians to doing their work. There's a business up in the Northwest uh, that makes cakes. That business got shut down because they didn't want to make a cake for a same-sex marriage because it went against their beliefs. They stood on the word and said, we're not going to do that. And because of that, the enemy went after them. And I believe now their business is shut down. But that's what, that's what the world is trying to do. They're trying to bully us to not speak the word of God, not follow the word of God, and not be bold in the things that we've learned of God. And that's what the world is doing. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did here. He said, look, he gave him a consequence. He said, hey, I'll put you in the fire and you'll die. We have brothers overseas. There was a family. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember what country it was. It was a husband and wife. Uh, they're in a Muslim country, but they believed in God. They would not, they would not sway on that. 
and the, uh, the guys came to their home and said, if you don't, we'll kill you. They didn't change not one bit. And what they did to that family is they threw the husband and wife in a pit of fire and the wife was pregnant. So we, that's what's happening outside of this, outside of this country. You're having some, people are dying for, for the truth that is God and they're not bending. That's boldness. And we have to have that same boldness here because what we're, what we're threatened of is what the world is doing now is, is defamation. They're, they're defamation, they're attacking, attacking the character of God. So they're defying God, which is disobedience. They're attacking the character of God. They're attacking the character of, of Christians. If you look out in the world, uh, Christians are always on the blunt end of a joke. You know, they, they say something, they'll make a joke. Oh, but Jesus, you know, they're, they're trying to make light of what we believe. We can't let that sway us. We have to, we have to be bold in our beliefs. And that's, that's what, what, what happens here. He was trying to get them to, uh, to go against what they believe, which it's even in the Ten Commandments that we should not worship any graven image. He was trying to get them to defy their own principles. Now, some people in the world, if you value the world more than you value God, and so be it, you allow yourself to, to fall into the area. But if you fall into that area, now you're going to fall in different things. You're going to fall into things like pluralism, 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 excuse me, uh, humanism and other things like that. And you'll be led away by all of these silly doctrines that are out there in the world. Now, when you, even when you look at these doctrines, they may seem logical, but you have to, you have to have the mind of the Lord and you have to walk in the spirit because when you do, you see beyond that. There are texts out there that tries to uh, try to attack the character of Jesus, saying that Jesus killed somebody when he was a kid, but brought him back to life. That's attacking the character of Jesus. People are always saying that someone, it was written by, the Bible was written by man, and they took stuff out and put stuff in. No, this is, this is the word of God. And if you truly study it, and you stop looking at the Bible through the lens of the world, you will be able to see clearly what the truth is. Amen? Amen. So now let's look at some other things because we, I've talked about how, how it is for uh, non-believers in the world. But, and I talked about how some, uh, some believers fall into uh, different areas of, um, of uh, disobedience where they may get led away by different doctrines. But also when we speak to non-believers, we're going to have to speak to believers as well because some of them believe in God, but they don't necessarily believe the same exact thing that you do. OK, and and those are tough situations to be in. I've been in a situation like that with a friend, I, not a friend, but a co-worker, I would say uh, an associate. Um, but this individual believes that Paul, he, he agrees with Paul, but then says Paul is trying to hold women back. That's the spirit of feminism. And that's not godly because and then we know that Paul, we know when we study the scriptures, that is not that is not the case. And if you truly study, you will get a revelation of that. But these people aren't studying that. Again, they're looking at the Bible through the lens of the world and they're interpreting it as, as we are now. And you can't do that because you miss a whole list of things. And now you're, you're, you're led to the point where you're thinking that, well, you can believe this God and this God and everything leads to the same point. That's not the case. But um, one thing I want to say is that once you receive the Holy Ghost, you now receive power, as it says in Acts. Uh, once the Holy Ghost came on them, Jesus said, once you receive the Holy Ghost, then you will receive power. And with that power, we receive authority. And it's, with, and it's through the Holy Spirit that we have boldness, that we speak with boldness when we go out there in the world. And uh, sometimes the world won't like it, but you keep pressing forward. Because we'll see here, sometimes you, by you speaking boldly, and why you speaking truth to people, you can save one or two people. There may be a thousand people who may not believe, but there could be those one or two people that do believe. So let's, let's look at some other scriptures here. I want to go to, a, let's jump to Acts, as I was talking about Acts, and we're going to talk about Stephen. Uh, so let's go to Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 8. We're going to read verses 8 through 10. Okay. 
All right. And once you get there again, say amen. <laughs> All right. So let's just look at the character of Stephen. Let's see what the word of God says about Stephen. Uh, verse 8 of chapter 6 in Acts. And Stephen, full of faith and power. If you go up a little before that, uh, you'll notice that it says in verse 5, it says, uh, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. They also chose Philip, but it specifically says Stephen was full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. We have to be full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. When you read verses, uh, when you read verses 8, remember, he's full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. And it says Stephen was full of, the, full of faith and power. Why was he full of power? Because he had the Holy Spirit. So because we have Holy Spirit, we have power. And because we have that power, we have authority. And because we have that authority and we have that power, now we need to add boldness with all of that when we go out there into the world. Amen? Amen. So now we, we know that Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people, his people. And let's go to verse, so now we're going to go down to verse 9. And then there arose certain of the synagogue, which are called uh, synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. So he was, so here's Stephen doing these marvelous works. And then there are some people that rose up, they were disputing against Stephen. And they said, <laughs> And they were, they were disputing with Stephen, but look at verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. See, he spoke with boldness and truth. We have to couple that truth with our boldness. And that's how we should speak when we deal with people in the world. Because just as they are bold, we have to be bold. They're not going to receive anything by us being timid. If you're in a conversation at work, uh, sometimes that, that conversation may say some things and it may be contrary to what you believe. You have authority to speak in boldness what you believe over that situation. Uh, somebody at work told me, I told him, I don't have bad days. He was like, well, no, you know, karma. I was like, I don't believe in karma. I was like, you can talk karma all you want, but I'll whoop karma because <laughs> I, I have authority. Um, but th th that was just my boldness at that time. Uh, because I didn't like, I didn't like what was being said. I was kind of stirred up. I was like, no, because I knew he was a believer and you can't be a believer and talk about karma at the same time. Well, you have good karma, bad karma. No, we just have Jesus and the Holy Spirit and we have faith. When we have faith, karma and luck, that doesn't have anything to do with it. We just apply faith to what we have and then we move forward. Amen. Uh, so, so one thing I want to say is don't shy away from the opportunity to speak truth or, or faith, the Holy Spirit gives us boldness when you walk in that spirit. But, uh, but here's one thing I want to I talk about with, with us, with our walk. Let's jump over to Colossians. And then we're almost, oh wow, we're almost done. Oh my goodness, okay. Uh, let's jump over to Colossians uh, 4. In verses five through six. And I'm going to turn there with you. Okay, Colossians chapter four, verses five. Okay, is everybody there? Amen. Okay, let's see what it says here in Colossians. It says, "This is talking about our walk." Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech always, I say always, it says always in the King James Version. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. When you walk in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us utterance. It speaks to us when we open our mouths to speak boldly, the Holy Spirit, God, fills our mouth. Even as I'm up here, as I speak, there are different things that come to me. Some of the stuff, I'd say a majority of the stuff that I spoke today is not even in my notes. But that's when you do, that's what happens when you operate in faith and you move in boldness by the Holy Spirit. 
He fills your mouth and he, the Holy Spirit brings things into our remembrance. The memory can be a tricky thing. Sometimes you can remember evil things that happen in your life and that can burden you and prevent you from moving on. But the Holy Spirit brings into our remembrance holy things. And when we, when we step up to speak to someone, you'll come to realize that all this scripture that you've been reading and that you've been studying, and I hope that you've been reading and that you've been studying, all of that scripture will well up, out, will well up inside of you and it'll come out and you won't even know where it came from. But when you follow the Holy Spirit, it's not you, it's not your intellect, it's the Holy Spirit working through you. It's God working through you and you have to let him work through you. Now he's using you to, to finish that work because just as Jarrell is working at the bank, I can't reach those people at, at the bank, wherever Teresa's working at, I can't reach those people, but Teresa can, or Teresa at the mall, there's people that she can reach. So, we, so if we all move with the Holy Spirit and speak with boldness, think of, we may, we may talk to a thousand people and we may only touch one, but that's okay because we're doing what we're commanded to do. And if we touch that one, then that one can touch two, that two can touch five, because remember, when we touch one person, we're, when we're out there in the, uh, in the world, it's basically we're out there in the uh, sowing field. So all we're doing is sowing seed. So when you speak the word of truth over somebody, you're sowing a seed into that person's life. Now, whether you get to water that seed or not, that's not for you to determine. But somebody else can water that seed and watch it grow. I myself am the benefactor of that, having a friend whom I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. I was like they were in Acts, uh, I believe it was chapter 19 or 17 or so. I was like the people in there. They had a zeal for God, but they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And uh, when, uh, I believe it was Peter uh, or Paul asked them, like, well, you believe, but have you received the Holy Spirit? I knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. And my friend, who's a minister, he's in Memphis. He was actually my barber at the time, too. He sowed a seed in my life that allowed me before he left to receive the Holy Spirit. And it's because I received the Holy Spirit that led me by the Spirit led me here. Now that I came here, that's where Pastor Robert and Pastor Christine and even other pastors that have came like Pastor Abel, uh, Pastor Flores from California, all of these people. And even when we watch the, uh, the presentation with uh, Nancy Dufresne, all of these people are watering that seed, but God gets the glory. So whatever seed you sow into somebody's life, you may not be the person that directly waters it. A lot of times we want instant gratification. Yeah. Somebody's hurting, we give them a word of encouragement, we give them a word of wisdom, we want them to come immediately to church and receive from God because we like, just need to come. I, I've fallen into that uh, my same self and it can be discouraging, but you can't let it discourage you. Still offer, offer them to come to church or anybody's church because again, you're just sowing a seed. Because we're, if, whether they go here or wherever they go, that seed is going to water. But remember, uh, when God's word goes out, it doesn't come back void. Amen? Amen. 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 So now, uh, what I want to do here, let's look at, we're going to look at one, uh, let's see. We're going to look at uh, two more verses of scripture and then we're going to be done. Uh, I think we'll still have enough time. Amen? Amen. So let's go to Acts chapter 17. Let's jump back to Acts. Now we're going to look at Paul because I think this is a, a shining example of how uh, in addition to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there, that's one example. And I think this is another example that's going to kind of put the cherry on top of everything that I'm saying, so to speak. That's the only, <laughs> that's the only analogy I had. <laughs> so I guess because I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, so um where was that okay yeah let's go to acts uh 17 oh i'm in 19 sorry let's go to acts 17 and then we're going to read verses 16 through 17 let me get there myself now uh now hold your spot there now i want to want you to understand that everything that happened before this Paul went into Thessalonica, where that's, we know that the church of the uh, Thessalonians, he preached there. Some people got riled up, said he's trying to turn the world upside down. 
And then they, they, tr they, they tried to attack him. They said, Paul, you got to get out of here. You got to go. He went next door <laughs> and he still preached the word. So he didn't let that discourage him. These, are, these were mobs of people because what happened was he cast a, a, a demonic spirit out of, the, out of a girl. And because he cast that demonic spirit out of the girl, the people who used that girl to gain a profit, they weren't getting any profit anymore because she would say, she would say things and that's how they would, that's how they would use her because she would, uh, they knew that Paul uh, and Silas were prophets. Nobody else knew. And she would run around kind of teasing them. Ah, oh, look at the prophets, da, da, da. She, he cast that spirit out of her. And then the people who had that girl, they weren't getting any money because she didn't have that spirit operating in her. Because of that, that led to a situation where they're like, hey, these guys, the, the gospel, they're turning the world upside down. We need to get, we need to get them and get them out of here. So he moved over to, uh, he went to the next city over, continued to preach the word. And then <laughs> they was like, they found out about it, stirred up another mob of people. And then they tried to come after him then. So he left and he went to Athens. And that's where it brings us to where we are now. Paul left uh, Thessalonica and I believe the city was uh, Berea. Yeah, he left Berea. Uh, and then he went to, uh, he came here to Athens. Now this is Paul uh, in the city of Athens. Now we read verse 16. Now Paul had asked Silas and Timothy, who we just read earlier, uh, it says here, Timotheus, because he was part Greek, uh, to, 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 come him, to come to him in Athens. He said, quickly come here. Uh, so now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with, and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So this, so Paul is in Athens and he's seeing all of, all of these people given to idolatry, just like we are in the world now. We see all of these people given to idolatry and he got stirred up. So we have to, we've gotten stirred up, but there's a lot of times that we don't act on it. Now that's not to say you, you rudely go up to somebody and say, hey, I don't think, you know, no, it's not that. What it is, he was stirred to action. That was boldness. Boldness causes you, causes something to well up in you to want to do something about it. And we have to live a stirred up life. We have to be stirred up. We get stirred up by different things. Some people get stirred up and they, they, they could write a book. You know, so you could do that. I mean, there's multiple things that can stir you up. In this situation, Paul was stirred up. They, and therefore disputed he in the synagogue, verses uh, 17, with the Jews and with devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. And notice this. Uh, remember, uh, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when you, uh, because you're received, you've been called. So whether you've been called up here or wherever, you're still called to preach, teach, and heal the sick. This is, a, this is a good example of that. He came to preach, teach, and heal the sick. He never shied away from teaching. Whether he got, prison, whether he got imprisoned or whether he was, uh, he was attacked, whether he was, uh, there was mobs after him, he never ceased. They tried to throw him out of one city. He just went to the city right next door and did the same thing over. They found that he did it, stirred up another mob, he just went to the next city and that landed him in Athens where he did this. Now, and the reason that you want to live this way is because you never know how God is going to use you. And I want you to look at something else. Uh, we, one thing too, we can't be sideline Christians. We can't, we, we can't say, yes, I believe in the God, unless I believe in God and believe in Jesus, but not willing to do anything about it when we encounter people. And don't worry about you being intelligent or not to be able to dispute these people. If you're not intelligent, if not, not just dumb, but if you, there's some areas that you're lacking, ask God for wisdom right. and he'll give it to you. Ask God for understanding, he'll give it to you, but you have to seek it. You can't sit there and ask God for wisdom and sit there and not do anything. Right. That's like saying, oh, like me, I want to run a 5K. I can't run a 5K and sit at home. So I got out one week, one week I ran a mile, okay? Uh, kept running, ran a mile and a half, ran two miles, and then ran two and a half miles. So a 3K is about uh, three miles. So I'm, I'm right there, so, but I'm pressing forward. So just as it is in the natural, so as it is in the spiritual. And like I said earlier, God is inching us forward. 
but we have to keep press we have to keep let, letting let him push us forward and we have to keep running remember we're, we're running a race so that's a good analogy i guess because I, i'm running and so we are running a race as well and we can't faint out or pass out in that race uh and <clears throat> see so let's let's look at another thing too here i want to go in um So let's look in here in Acts. We're in, we're in the same chapter. Let's jump down to verses 18. Then certain, uh, in Acts 17, we just read uh, verse 17. Let's read verse 18. Then certain philosophers of uh, the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Uh, other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So what did they do? They took him and brought him unto uh, Areo, Areopagus, saying, we may know what is, saying, uh, we may know what is this new doctrine whereof thou speakest of. So these are the Athenians, and uh, Areopagus was like the high council, or the high, uh, that was where all of the, there was a lot of uh, well-off people. There was a lot of judgment. This is where all the intellectuals were. So they brought him there so that he could talk, so that he could talk to him. They, they said amuse us because the, the Athenians, they were, they were so willing to hear whatever new doctrine was out there in the world. They was like, we just want to hear something. Oh, this is new, so let's hear that. Let's, and now if you read some more, you find out that they laughed. And they laughed at him when he talked about the, resu the, resu the resurrection of Christ. So let's... Uh, jump down to verse 32 in chapter 17. And so this is after, now I would say read all that stuff that happened before verse 32, because this is uh, where Paul is defending his faith. And sometimes we may be put in a situation where we have to defend our faith. Don't shy away from it. If you don't, if you're, if you're, uh, you may encounter somebody, there are a lot of atheists out there who study to combat Christians on what they believe but if there's something that you don't understand then just believe God for more understanding and be ready for situations like that because they're going to come and it's through that that we'll be able to uh, overcome the world and maybe even gain another believer uh, through you so let's look at verse 32 and this is after he spoke to them about the unknown God that they have and they worship he says in uh, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead some mocked and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Verse 34 is key. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, clave unto, clave unto Paul, and believed, among which was uh, Dionysus, or I'm, I might be pronouncing that wrong, I think that's, that's something else, uh, the uh, Ariel Pagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So out of all of these, these intellectuals, they laughed at him. They said, but we'll hear it again. But here are two believers, and there were some others that did believe, and they followed Paul, and we later know that they furthered Paul's ministry, and they helped him out in Athens and other areas. And, but that's what we're doing, because we see here that all of the people he disputed with in the synagogues, all of the intellectuals that he disputed with, two people Maybe a few actually received something from that. But those two people led to other churches being established and led to the furthering of the gospel. Amen? Yeah. So that's why we have to be uh, stirred up. So why am I talking about boldness? Because let's, uh, let's recall some of the teachings that, that Pastor Robert and Pastor Christine have went over. What have we learned about? We learned about joy. We've learned about our provisions with camels that Pastor Christine talked about. Uh, we also learned about faith giving and increasing our faith. Uh, so with that learned, so what's happening is the Lord is trying to stir us up to, for in that next area that we go to. So let's look at this, this last verse, and this is going to be the last one. Um, let's go to Exodus uh, 12. Chapter 12, verses 2. And I want you to understand, everything that we've done today is holy. From the Holy Communion, to our, off, to our tithes, to our offerings, to our coins, to our faith pledges, 
All of that is holy unto God. And we're going we're gonna to see why. When you get to Exodus 12, 2, say amen. amen. So this is um, after, this is, this, is what Mo, this is what the Lord said to Moses and, and Aaron in Egypt about the Passover. He said, in verses 2, he said, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So again, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now what's happening? Next week, this is our last Sunday here. Next week, we're going, we're going to be at our new church. Next week is our Passover. So the pa what, is it, what do we know about the Passover? That's the beginning of the year. So after the Passover, that starts the, that starts the beginning of the year uh, for the Israelites. So the same for us. When we have Passover, it's going to be Sunday on the 25th. That the next day is going to be Easter Sunday. It's going to be the 1st first of, first of April. So we understand that now <laughs> what we're doing is that we're moving out from the old, like Pastor Christine said, and we're moving into the new. But as the word says, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So when we go over there, that's going to be the beginning of our next chapter, the beginning of the next phase that we're going to move into. And we're going to have to move into that, into that area with an increased boldness of faith, boldness of joy, and, and boldness of, of everything. Because as we said earlier, there's a world out there that's sick. There's a community over there, here, that's sick. They need, we need to preach the word, we need to teach the word, and we need to heal the sick. We have to heal the sick people out there in that community. And, and so that's what's happening right now. That's, that's the last thing we're going to do. So listen, this is our new beginning. We're leaving this old place and we're going on to something new. When we go over there, that's going to be Passover. We've already partake of the Lord's Supper. So we know that we're just as uh, they were delivered from bondage in Egypt. Uh, God delivered the world and we've been delivered through faith from this building. So now we're moving into the next phase. God is stirring us up to move into that next phase of where he's going to take us. But it, we can't do it without boldness of faith, boldness of truth and boldness of joy and of all the things that we've learned over the past uh, past couple of months. And that's the area that we got to move in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I hope everybody got something today. Uh, it was a lot of studying. I certainly got a lot out of it too. Uh, and I, I pray that those of you watching uh, in Spring, Texas, and also uh, for our Oasis Fellowship in Arlington. I had to think about that. Sorry. But uh, let's go ahead and stand up, everybody. Uh, we want to thank everybody for those of you who joined us online. Uh, watching us, we, we certainly appreciate you. We thank you this morning. And we're going to end with a, uh, with a word of prayer. Everybody bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus.